wouldn't recognize him today. The second person over is uh, Bob Foster. There is me, and there's some guy named Carl Marks. And Sir uh, and this, the odd thing about this photo is that Scott Shaw is not wearing a Hawaiian shirt that Carl Marks is. <laughs> <laughs> this is a variety show. This is from a sketch I did on one of the Croft variety shows I did. I, I was in the sketch. I'm on the far right here. Uh, this, we did a roast of Abraham Lincoln. This is one of the Dean Martin roasts. And we had uh, 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 John Wilkes Booth was played by Red Buttons. <laughs> the fellow playing Abraham Lincoln, you may recognize Danny, Jim Varney, who was Abraham. Hmm. It's me or his commercials, you know. Um, that's me with Pink Lady. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Allen and Stan Freeberg. I mean, this, I, I had this photo. Everybody I ever hmm. plagiarized when I was younger. <laughs> uh, that's Lorenzo Music. That's the man who was the voice of Carlton Your Doorman over the Bob Lord show with the voice of Garfield. A uh, lovely man who passed away way too soon. Wait, when Lorenzo passed away, uh, they, I go to the uh, funeral and they, I, I had made a speech. And, you know, show this funeral just to be a little funny. So I really liked that was a funny speech. And I get there and I ask his son, who am I following? And he said, oh, uh, I think that man over there. And then over there was Bob Newhart. <laughs> okay, is there anyone in the world who would less want to follow than Bob Newhart? I found out when Howie Morris passed away, I went to the funeral, yes, you less want to follow Carl Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> so a friend of ours named Comedian Great Comedy Writer, Pat McCormick, passed away. And I had to get you know, this speech, it was the same, they're all the same places. They were all the funerals, the same, the writers were here. And when I was sitting there, Giving my speech, Bob Newhart was sitting in this one seat directly in front of the podium the entire time. And I thought to myself, what the hell am I doing up here with these down there? And I couldn't even look at it. But finally I said something that was funny and got a laugh in the right, so I looked. I said, ah, he's laughing at I'll never look at him again. Anyway. <laughs> so now, same thing happened. Carl Reiner was sitting in that chair. So when Pat McCormick passed away, I was just speaking at that. I was in charge of the seating. I thought to myself, okay, I can put in that chair anybody I want to be one of the guest speakers. I'm going to put the person in who will intimidate the people the most. This is my private thing. I looked at the whole guest list, and in that chair, I put the person so that every single person who got up there on the podium had to speak I directly in the face of George Carlin. <laughs> Uh, the guy that brought you is my friend Frank Ferranti. You've probably seen me very well my blog. He does a great impression of. Uh, we went to, uh, to see him do his Groucho show. If you ever get a chance to see it, he is so wonderful. This is the voice cast of the current Garfield show. Uh, Frank Walters on the left, and me in the back. The guy with the long hair and uh, mustache in the back is Wally Winger, who's a new voice of John. And he's the voice of. Uh, he's Jay Leno's announcer on The Tonight Show. Hmm. And he'll be on our panel, voice panel, on Saturday. And there's June Ferre, Stan Friedrich, Lady with the Red Harry Morris, Summer. Uh, the guy in the check shirt is uh, Jason Mars, who will be on the panel. He's the voice of Normal. He'll be on the panel on Sunday. As will Greg Burke, who will be the voice of Woody and Wright. And that's me with Henry Gibson. Mm -hmm. Henry Gibson. Uh, this is me with a man named uh, Eddie Carroll, who is a professional Jack Benny impersonator. Which is a lovely man. Mm -hmm. uh, Leonard Malton, Carolyn, myself, and Frank Ferranti again. There's me interviewing Jerry Robinson. There's a voice panel. I mean, there's, there's there's Joe Paul Lewis and myself in the middle thing. There's Carolyn. There's uh, Dick Ears and Joe Sinon. Mm. Uh, this is that's Charlie Koch, and that's Al Jaffe, who does the foldings for Mad Magazine. And the great thing about this photo is you can fold it over and you can fully eliminate Al Jaffe. Joe <laughs> <laughs> Simon, John Romita, and Joe Sinon. That's uh, Dave Goals, who is the voice of Gonzo. <laughs> The only person who ever played John Lee. The only, the only Muppeteer from the classic character still doing this character. Hmm. That's Lou Scheimer, who used to run Filmation Studios. That's some guy I don't know him. <laughs> There's Stan Lee getting another the damn awards. <laughs> Neil Gaiman and Sergio's got something across his teeth. Uh, that's Chase Craig, who my first editor in comics. Hmm. That would be my start. Uh, that's Nick Carney, left. And now the right is the late Gene Colin. Uh, uh, the man on the, on the left, a friend of mine named Richard Sherman, who wrote all the songs of Mary Poppins mm -hmm. and Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, and every damn song that runs through your head after you leave Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> the man on the left 
Anybody know who that is? Jack Davis. Jack Davis. Hmm. Uh, there's Chuck McCann, Leonard Mullen, me, and Buddy Hackett. <laughs> Buddy's wearing gloves for some reason. Not a good deal. Uh, Self-explanatory. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Sergio Aragonis. <laughs> Names in the comics, they were like, 
It would be pointed at the room, and by the time the next issue came out, they'd be gone. The Prince of Chichester. The Prince of Ch Dan Chichester. He was running gag. Yes, yes, he was a running gag in the comic longer than he was the editor. <laughs> <laughs> so then we went on to Image. The editor of the book again was no one. And so, now in Dark Horse, we have to have an editor, and we've been dealing with different editors, and they keep changing on us. They keep leaving, or they keep reassigning, or whatever. We lost our editor on the roof a little while ago, and nobody bothered to appoint another one. <laughs> we just had a meeting this morning with Mike Richardson, and he uh, was the publisher, and he basically said, he said, where is the Collins standing? And we're saying, well, we're waiting for the editor to call us. And he said, well, who's the editor? And he said, nobody. <laughs> We've been like in limbo for one of these things we just fell through the crack. Sergio has finished the first two issues of New Conan. They look fabulous. Um, as soon as they get it, Mike promises we'll assign an editor, we'll get on with it. I think the book will be scheduled before the year is out. And it will be followed immediately by... Oh! Carol oh, 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 oh. Burnett. <laughs> 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 I'm going to do Blue Meets Tarzan. Yes. And, uh, yes. We are very lucky that we have the same artist that is drawing. Uh, Conan is going to draw Tarzan. I don't think he knows it yet. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Yates. Tom Yates, which is fantastic. The, the pages of Brew, Conan, they are exquisite, the ones that we have combined. I was a little afraid of that change, you know, having a serious artist fighting Brew. But the way he draws it is just it's perfect. You know, and it's lovely, lovely, great. Tell, tell them what else you're up to. Ah. <laughs> I have a new comic book that just came out. It's called Sergio Aragones Ponies. And uh, I don't know if you remember a comic that came out published by DC called Solo. They were personal stories. Each issue was a different artist. And mine was issue 11. And we... We had uh, personal stories on that one about samurais, the western, something that happened to me, that way I, I killed Mari Feldman. <laughs> well, that's the title of the story. I, he was in Mexico. And you have to read the story. <laughs> but so why don't you tell the story to people who don't know the story? Okay, I will. Um, I Mark did a great story on the, on the same book about Batman. They might pray. But the story is that with Mari Feldman, which I, I adore his work, I have been a fan of his for many years. It's a long story, but I, I was shooting a movie in Mexico. I'm doing a movie called To Kill a Stranger. And I was a villain there, a, 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 a sergeant of a regular army. And uh, what was it? Like a federal, with a uniform. And uh, the director was a friend of mine, that's what I was doing the movie. Uh, it was with uh, Aldo Ray, Donald Pleasant, um, the boy with the boy with the green hair. Dean Stockwell. Dean Stockwell. Dean Stockwell, Mexican actress, and myself. Okay, so. I'm in the set, and I realize that they're shooting a movie called Yellow Beer with my family. I said, really? Yeah, this let's go. I said, oh, great, I'm going to see them, because I, I really admire them. So I, I go outside, and I'm dressed like a, with a short and mustache, and with a gun, and with a feather. And I saw Marty Feldman, and I go, Marty Feldman! Oh, I love you! And he's just totally panic, you know? And then I start blundering because I became a fanboy, you know? Oh, I love you! I'm a, I'm a cartoonist from Mad Magazine. Well, I'm an actor, but I'm not an actor, I'm a cartoonist. I'm, I'm playing a comic, I'm not a real comic, even the gun is not real. Well, that meant was just backing up. Please <laughs> <laughs> <just> freak out! <laughs> this big, gigantic, because he was very short, this gigantic cop. They know these stupid things, you know. <laughs> so I says, I'll meet you tomorrow, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll meet you tomorrow. And I says, sure, sure. <laughs> so I asked the director to let me go up before because I had to try to change to go to see him. He says, what are you dressing? He says, I have to go and, 
I meet my family. I says, did you know? He just passed away last night. You know? <laughs> so that was it. So I, I felt so bad, you know, because the only time I had a chance to talk to him. And then Don to me, I hope he didn't die of was scared. <laughs> <laughs> I go like even closer. But on the comic I call it that I kill Marifel. <laughs> but it's a it's a it's a I draw better than I talk. So <laughs> <laughs> you have to see the draw. The premise here is that Mr. Feldman perhaps thought that that was a real policeman who might find substances he had in his pocket at that time mm. which something will kill him. So yeah, he was uh, scared that the, the police were coming after him. Yeah, well, mm. it, it was the altitude. Mexico is uh, 6,000 feet of the sea level. So it was the, the altitude and the spot. So, but that type of story, I, I have done other comics before. One for, uh, I think it was that horse when I met Richard Nixon. I did another one when I... You couldn't kill the right person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we liked Marty Feldman. <laughs> And the other one was when I was doing an aquatic ballet in uh, uh, college. <laughs> yes, I uh, was on a synchronous ballet thing. Have <laughs> <laughs> you really told the story yet about stunt doubling for, for Sheena Pinot the Jungle? No. <laughs> <laughs> Have you told the story about the TV weather there? Oh, no. <laughs> well, you know, no it it a lot of things happened to me. I don't know why. It <laughs> 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 happened to me since I was a kid. So I figured, out, well, I, I want to do a comic explaining all these stories, terrible stories. And besides the regular silly stories that I tell, like silly things, like Google, and, and, uh, and cartoons, so I decided to do this comic of Sector Oregon Spanish. Bongo jumped into it, and they, they said, please, we want to do it, and this is terrific. So the first issue just came out yesterday, and it's going to be a monthly. And this is the one time. And I have it on my table. I 1,000. And uh, we hope uh, that people enjoy it because they have all these stories that Max mentioned. It. Yeah, that, that was the most embarrassing thing in my life. No. It's, it's another, it's another Sergio Aragonese project where I don't get paid, but this time I don't think the way works. Maybe it's time you get paid. That's all. <laughs> And uh, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing. Uh, we, we start uh, doing issue number three of uh, Corner, which is already in the process. Um, I'm, I'm doing a special for uh, uh, the, the Simpsons. I'm doing a, a whole issue of Maggie, which is that. Uh, I'm doing pages for them, so I'm doing a complete issue for Bongo. Uh, that makes three comics a month. So I, I would be able to do it. So what are you doing with the rest of the month? Well, I'm working for the Mad Show, the Mad Television Show, which uh, I'm doing cartoons of animation of the uh, animated Mad Radio and other characters. And I'm doing Mad, but I just finished a Mad Look at Lady Gaga, which is <laughs> the out of the next issue. Oh, nice. Four? Okay. I'm doing <laughs> Stan, why don't you tell us what you're up to? I haven't finished. Oh, <laughs> I think he was finished. I'm doing that. You're finished a long time. I'm doing that. 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 I'm done, and then I rested. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's mm. the, the weirdest thing that everything piled up at the same time, which never happened before. You know, you do this, you do that, you do that, and now everything is fine. But I, I, will, I will survive. Before I forget, anybody saying in the back, if you can't hear well, wave to me. All right, can we crank the audio up a little bit? Okay, let me start with the story of Amy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, did anyone notice my
but exactly what time I lost control of the final. Uh, Sergio got there. Yeah, Sergio got there. Yeah, I, did, I did that pretty him up here was a mistake. <laughs> Uh, Stan, tell us what you're up to. Uh, I'm still working on Usagi Ojimbo. I, uh, the 200th issue of Usagi, which, which is Dark Horse issue number 141, is actually the 200th issue of, that I have done. Uh, com- if you count all the fan graphic books and the uh, uh, Mirage issues, then it's number 200. Um, let's see. I guess that's it. <laughs> Oh, I have a show at the museum. I also received the Culture Ambassador Award this year. Um, I'm going to be in the Nisei Parade. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to be the guy for the crowd back. Oh, okay. You'll be sitting up on the side. Well, I don't know. You have to start reading now. You'll be sitting in the car just waiting for people to have faces to Give us a demonstration of what that would look like. I'm working at Bento Boss currently on a new show that's called Alan Gregory. It's going to premiere soon on Fox. Uh, oh, there. And um, it's interesting because over time, they have um, this animation goes into uh, more and more digital. Uh, and uses uh, computers, they found that they don't really need timing directors anymore. They don't think. So, uh, which is what Gordon does, the timing director. So, um, they were working on a show called Fox Burgers, and the show was coming back, and they said, maybe we need timing directors. So, they brought us back and they created a program, so we're now doing it on the computer instead of on paper. It's very interesting. Um, and I'm, I'm enjoying this a lot. I'm also working on the 37th version of Spider Man. That um, uh, uh, Stars is doing with Marvel, and um, yeah, I think also a bunch of stuff over at Warner Brothers. A lot of Batman movies where where um, terrible things happen to people, uh, <laughs> including like the Joker killing Robin. You know, stuff like that's pretty painful. Um, and, and I think uh, they keep retelling how Batman's parents were killed, and over and over I seem to get those scenes all the time too. It's entertaining. <laughs> I got other things to do. Oh, what? I just remembered I am supposed to, I think, doing a Rocketeer story for the uh, Rocketeer anthology. Oh, with a rabbit in it? With a rabbit in no. <laughs> And I'll be doing a, a story uh, for the Houston Monster anthology, uh, Legends of the Monster. And let's see, and still doing that with Spider-Man and Mr. Distress. And the, I think that's it. Mm-hmm. We'll think of something else later. I'll be, I'll be interrupting you guys. Okay, Mark. Let's, Mark. Oh, uh, let's see, I must have a job somewhere. Uh, yes, I am, I, am, I am writing and I am the supervising producer, I don't know what that means, and the writer and voice director of the Garfield Show, which is seen on Cartoon Network in every, in every single country on this entire planet, including China now. Uh, and, uh, anyway, <laughs> and we're doing the third season now. I just wrote and directed an episode, an hour-long special. I'll tell you the title of it, which three people in this room who love Garfield will probably be excited about. The title of the episode is called Long Lost Lyman. Anyone know what that means? Lyman was a character who was in the original Garfield newspaper strip for a few years. He was John's roommate. And they just just dropped him from the strip. He hasn't been seen all this time. Is that what that feels like? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I'm <laughs> 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 doing Alan King now. Anyway, so, uh, uh, so I wrote an episode which tells what happened to Ryan and where he's been, and it'll air in about a year <laughs> now. But we're also going to do the third season, and we're about to start the fourth season. And uh, I've been spending night and day writing these things and voice directing them, and we've had some wonderful actors on the show. Most of them will be on our voice panels either uh, Saturday or Sunday. I'm doing two cartoon voice panels here on Saturday and Sunday. For those who are interested, by the way, I am in this room for four consecutive panels here today. The next one, uh, I'm going to be interrogating a gentleman who for years was the head of Marvel Comics went over to DC. And he's going to, Mr. Roy Thomas is sitting over the audience there. Okay. And then, and then
I'm going to talk to Roy for an hour, and then we're going to have Sergio back here, and we're going to have a bunch of people who currently work for Mad Magazine, including the editor and the art director, discussing the current state of Mad Magazine. And then after that, at, uh, that's, uh, let's see, it says, Roy's 3.30, Mad Pal's 4.30, the 5.30, I'll be interviewing Mr. Paul Levitz, who's one who recently stepped out and running DC Comics here. Tomorrow morning at 12, uh, tomorrow at 12 noon, I'll be doing a panel uh, honoring Gene Colan. Um, on, uh, at uh, 2 30, I'm doing a panel called That 70s Panel, which is going to uh, um, uh, be about comics of the 70s. At uh, 10 a.m. on uh, Saturday, I'm hosting a panel called 50 Years of Comic Fandom. Do you believe Comic Fandom is 50 years old? That's scary. Uh, that's in the 24 ABC. At 11 45 on Saturday morning, quick draw. Yeah. <laughs> The panels in Hall H are, um, you know, all the movie, run by movie studios downstairs. This is a 6,000 seat room and movie studios in there, and they're shuttling big stars in and out. And also in Baldwin, when they have uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the banquet tomorrow night, by the way, or not the reward ceremony is in Baldwin 20, and they were telling me um, that they, they're worried that they won't be able to set up because the last panel of the day in Baldwin 20 is Conan O'Brien is going to be down there. And they came to me and they asked me earlier, if he runs along, what do we do? I said, tell him that Jay Leno is taking over in that room. He'll <laughs> <laughs> yeah, love that. Anyway, <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, anyway, so the pilot has a holiday in Baldwin 20. They have these reserved passes that they give out. They put out these passes. When you get into the studio, and, and so the studio can give them to the people they want to have get in, you know, special favors or people who work on the project. And one of the, the companies that is programming a lot of the movie studios, that is programming a lot of the panels out of Hall H this year, is a company that's made is Quick Draw Entertainment. And for some reason this year they mail all of their passes to me. <laughs> they said, like, oh, Quick Draw, what's Quick Draw? They said, oh, that's m &M. okay. <laughs> and they sent me all the passes for the whole age panels, and, and I was going to go out and sell money today, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Quick Draw is 11.45, Sergio, Scott Shaw, and our guest cartoonist uh, this year will be... Sorry. Is there a Geiger counter in this room? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? It's my phone, I'm sorry. Oh, all right, um, Mike Pizzolo will be the third cartoonist. Uh, that, and if you go to that room and stay there, my first cartoon voice panel will be in the same room. You can stay over at Double Feature uh, at 1 o'clock. And on that panel, we will have uh, the first cartoon voice panel uh, Wally Wingert, Sarah Tilda Valentine, Tara Strong, Townsend Coleman, Rob House Paulson, and Robin Atkins Down. Uh, are you going to be showing the Simmons Lights? Yes. And the same ones, yes. Okay. And on Sunday, uh, <laughs> well, at 10 o'clock, Jack Kirby for your panel. 11.30, Cartoon Voices 2. 2 o'clock, Cover Story. 3 o'clock, This is Cartoon Voices. Anyway, so I'm doing the Cartoon Show, and I'm doing, um, what else am I doing? I'm doing Rule We Do It. I'm doing, um, I'm running a screenplay for a studio that I don't know if they'll, the pan, I don't know if they'll ever make it. Um, it's about everything. Oh, we just, my friend Carol, and Carol is not here, uh, she wanted to be here today, but she is at home, at my house right now, sending to press the first volume of the complete Pogo. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it is here, she did an amazing job of art directing it and protecting her father's legacy, as you know, she's the daughter of Walt Kelly. And uh, it is a fabulous looking book, and uh, you will want a copy of this very badly. I hope she sells me one. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we're about to, up to the questions from the floor part of this entire thing. Yes, sir. Actually, uh, regarding Pogo, seeing as it's been delayed for so many years, and is, are things in place so that it will be coming out on a consistent basis? Yes. Way? It was just hard to find the first years, the first year. It was just, Nobody saved this stuff, and we, we, we finally found all the collections and stuff like that. So it'll be out. Once it starts, it'll come out regularly. How often? Well, it's, it's, it's if you want to use the microphone, then we can let people come hear your questions. The question was, will the be coming out regularly? 
and uh, the answer is yes, it will be. I, I don't know, they're, they're coming every six months. And if you have any questions, if you would like to please stand up on the line and get the microphone, then we can hear all of us from your friend. Where's the stampede? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we have one question. Guys, I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, my first ever comic book was Brew back in the epic days, and I stuck around for some reason, and, and it's been fun. Uh, I just wanted to say that this is my first time back at Comic Con in over 18 years, and it's a complete different animal, about five times the people. Um, and I guess this is more directed to Mark, but towards you guys as being in the industry. How do you feel Comic-Con and the industry has changed from 18 years ago to today? Well, the industry is no longer about publishing comic books. And the board is this convention. And, and people will admit that there aren't comic books here. Well, there are comic books. You just have to look, little, you just have to look between the glee panels to find them. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, actually, about, about a year or two ago, this guy comes up to the convention. And he says uh, to me, I'm so sick of this convention. I, I want to hear about classic comics and important, you know, the history of comics and all of these movies and hyping Hollywood stuff like that and that garbage. You know, I, I would, would think, Mark, that you would do something to bring the convention back to its roots. And I said, well, today I did a panel at this convention about the history of Batman. I had the last three surviving Bob Kane ghosts on stage discussing their work. It doesn't get any more golden age than that. The first time these guys have ever been together discussing how it was to draw Batman in the 40s. When you left the panel, he said, no, I had to get in line for the Lost panel. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. But the, the problem with, with the industry now, and we don't want to get too much on that, is that nobody is really interested in publishing comics. They're still using comics as the, as the anchor for multimedia, you know, public studio stuff and, 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 and movies and TV and video games. Things have blurred, and now you can't really do a comic book. It's only a comic book with the major publishers. It has to have potential to spin into other media. And that's look at this convention. I mean, look at the DC booth. The DC booth is not about comic books. The DC booth is about the Batman movie, the Green Lantern movie, and things like that. They're not even pushing comic books. Yeah, but in the other hand, people who have never read comics, they are in our tables discovering a comic book world. So it's benefits and unbenefits. The benefits is the amount of people that if you want to go someplace, you can. The other one is that every young cartoonist has a chance now to make real money. Because maybe they can sell their comic book to a larger movie, as it has happened many times already. And for the people of the industry, realizing that the majority of viewers in the United States are youthful people who go to see whatever is there for them in the weekend, they are exploiting that, and the only way to do it is of what they love when they grew up to our comics. So it's a symbiotic relationship, and everybody benefits from it. It has made the San Diego Con enormous before it was just a few tables of people selling on comics. Now, they're still there, but now you see all these magnificent toys and things that everybody can benefit from it. I think it's the best thing that ever happened to the industry. The problem is the kids who are using, you know, those things to text instead of reading. But that has nothing to do with a comic book. It's a problem that many publishers lost it many years ago for not taking care of a new readership. Other countries are very advanced in technology and they're still reading comics. Why? Because the publishers took care of the younger ones coming in and the publisher abandoned them. So they have to deal with it. This country right now is trying to get the younger people to read comics. Let's hope they do, but conventions like this will help I think. And yet, let's go. The next question from my friend Tom Galloway. Two things. It did occur to me when we brought up Carol Burnett that I would paint a three day groovings Ken Conway comic. <laughs> <laughs> and which of them would be the more ahead? That's the question. 
Uh, other thing, uh, on Gru, uh, aside from the obvious involving swords and the lopping off of heads, how would Gru resolve the current debt ceiling crisis? <laughs> how, would, how would Gru resolve the current, current debt ceiling crisis? I just answered, who? What? <laughs> That's what he would say. He wouldn't know, but Gru is always the only way he knows that. He would feel that costs it so much. And there will be no crisis. <laughs> Well, since we have a spare feet of mind with the, the, the questioning microphone, uh, we have Gary, you've got to go to the microphone. Sergio is making people go to the microphone to see that. Gary Grosman, by the way, is one of the people who know more about Drew. Sometimes, when I want to know something about Drew, I call him. <laughs> <laughs> but he knows it. He knows everything. So, please. How do you follow that? I ask you to ask me a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, Bob, I think it was last November there was some, some little blurb about the uh, there would be new Gru uh, models or characters uh, done by the same company that's done the latest Usagi Jimbo. And yes. so is that still going on? Is that still in process? Let me ask Gary. <laughs> I was going to ask you the same question. No, the gentleman who is a, is a great sculptor and he did the most magnificent Usagi figures that mm. you can see at, the, at his booth at, at yeah, the not, table. Not at my group, no. You don't have it? You, 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 you Usagi figures? Well, there are two series. Uh, I was working on the third series right now. You don't have that one? I don't have the uh, Well, because uh, Royale could not, I don't think he's at the time, because he had. Uh, some meaning with his work on a new movie. Oh, so. But it's a great sculpture, and he approached me to see, to do the, the group things, and I was sort of delighted, because I saw the ones that he did of Usagi, and they were magnificent. So, most probably, if he gets out of the movie and he gets time back to sculpting, he's going to do the whole series of these magnificent sculptures. But again, it all depends on work. You know? Nowadays, work prevails. You know, when you want to do other things, if you get paid work, we have a question from a very small sleeping child. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, that would be uh, where can uh, where can you get a copy? Where can you get a copy of the uh, the new Sergio Aragones comic that just came out? Uh, second question would be whether the group card game is going to come back into print. And the third question it, to Sergio and Stan is both of you work in a very non, uh, non-photorealistic, non non um, uh, whatever the convention is that uh, superhero comics tend to follow, art style, both have very unique art styles that are a little bit more simplified. Um, over the years, how has your, your art style affected the kind of story you write? He's, a, he's got a lot of questions. No, 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 just uh, start at the beginning, but uh, the comic you can get in every comic book shop, uh, and if they don't have it, they tell the mail, and when you to carry it, you're going to The other, if you are here, you can get it at the Bongo booth or at my table, but uh, I am at, you know, 1,000. I-7. Huh? I-7. I-7. <laughs> I have a table there, and I have it. So I'd be very glad to, to sell it to you. But uh, the second question was about the card game. No, it will be that it was. Um, it came out. The only I had to, like a box with them, like about like, ten left to earn like, for collectors. I know it won't be done again in, in paper. Probably eventually, if somebody's interested, they could contact me and get something on the computer. And the third one, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it has changed. It has changed. Well, I started off wanting to do superhero stuff, but then my career took a left turn, uh, basically after I met you. Later, <laughs> 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 he claims that he doesn't get paid. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. You answer that. Well, it is, it is a difficult, very difficult field to compete with superheroes because a lot of the superheroes are bought by collectors, people who have a tradition of buying comics because they're superheroes, 
because they associated with something that is comic books. But to us, comic books were humor, but they started, and I am a humorist, and we like the humor. It has put us on a very difficult sales difference. The superhero comics sells very much. Our humor sells very little. We do it because we love it and because probably it's the only thing we know how to do well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should point out that Usagi is not strictly humor. I mean, there's a lot of drama and action. Is it? Yeah. But basically, I've always gone for a readership of one, which is what the type of things that I like to read. And I'm just fortunate that there is enough people that like the same thing that has uh, enabled me to continue. Yeah, we are very lucky that we have a, a strong fan following. And they have supported Ru and Usagi through all these years, and they love it. And when people find it, they realize how good this comic is, and they get into the, into the group. But our growing up readership is, is not geometrically, you know, it's, a, it's a slow, but it is there. And the, the comics is a difficult thing to compete against. Yes, sir. Uh, growing up, you know, reading Mad Magazine, I love uh, Spy vs. Spy, and of course, your little cartoons in the margins. And I'm reading the uh, souvenir book, uh, the eulogy you did for Antonio. Uh, you know, it's it's very hard for me to read. Uh, do you want to say anything else about him, like fourth with Antonio? Well. Antonio Proye has uh, passed away a few years ago. He was a new friend of mine. He was the first person I met when I, when I arrived to my magazine. Uh, he called me immediately his brother to name that all that because he called me Antonio Proye's brother, which I think wasn't good. He, he was a gentleman, he was a Cuba refugee, and uh, a very unique style. And because his English was not so good, and mine was even worse. So we spoke many times together, and uh, we have been here many times, and he was a very good, 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 good friend of mine, to the day he died. And I... Thank you. Next question, please. That's the Exotic Chef from the Museum. Why, what is? Um, in Usagi Ojimbo, Usagi has a son by, uh, that's really not acknowledged by everybody except by the son, Jotaro. Have you ever considered a son for Gru? I don't think Gru knows how to do this. <laughs> no, I think he still believe in that sport. <laughs> uh, no, he one of those very strange things. Uh, uh, when we were doing the group many times, many people will ask about the origins, because when they read superheroes, they all have origins. So, talking with Mark, we decided, well, maybe we should do an origin story. And I said, well, I don't have an origin story for group, because to me, group was born big, you know. <laughs> and so Mark wrote a wonderful book called uh, The Life of Groove, that he completely wrote that by himself, and it was a wonderful story. No, I didn't do that. Yeah, of course, the time. <laughs> 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 it was not the story. It was yeah. completely his brain. I can't keep track of whose story some of this stuff. Yeah, but that was. I used to think that, you know, the most successful was my idea. It wasn't even pure. <laughs> what happened also is that many people ask me about how Guru sounds. Well, to me, it sounds in Spanish. So, if people want to know how Guru sounds, they have to ask Mark, because he's an expert in voices. To me, it's, uh, I cannot figure him speaking English. So, how does Guru sound? How does Guru sound? Imagine. Uh, the love child of Frank Drescher and Gilbert Gottfried. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know what he sounds like. Um, it's interesting because for years, you know, I would write 
I wrote the books about these kinds of books and the Jackie Duck kind of books. And I would hear no Lank or, or, or Yogi Bear. I hear Jaws Butler's voice in my head. And when you do group, there's no, there's no voice to lock on to. It's one of the different things about, you know, when I wrote Superman, I didn't have a voice in my mind for Superman. I just kind of thought it was a raw voice. But uh, it's different. And then Gru kind of has evolved into, I have a speech pattern for him, but I don't know, really know what he sounds like. And one of these days, when we do something in animation with him, we'll have to decide. And I guarantee you that the voice I think is right, he won't think is right. The voice he thinks is right, I won't think is right. But, no, I, 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 it's, it's uh, back to your, to your taste. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, want to take, I want to copy this tape. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, the status of the Guru anthology that was supposed to come out? Well, yeah, what's the status of the Guru anthology? What's the status of the Guru anthology? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is that somebody told us that we were doing an anthology, and I was the last one to know about it. <laughs> so, when, as soon as we finish with this project, and start with the thing, we will really pay more attention to the anthology, because it's a... I don't want to publish another collection of everybody. This is the same people who are buying it. You know, I feel exploitative sometimes when we repeat printing the same thing with the same guys. So we want it to be fresh. How many people, people here would like to see more reprints of the old Guru comics? Do yeah. you want more? Yeah. Would you like a large print like King King with all recolor by Tom Luth collected? Not by number, but by stories. Yeah. And would you like it for a dollar? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, you so would I! <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the serious answer to the question is the Dark Horse wants to reprint more of the old blues, sort of not only the, year, the, the epic issues, and things like that, and do it in a couple different volumes. And um, we want to do this, but there have been logistic problems in securing, finding the right material, and also it doesn't help the fact that I frequently do not have an editor. And <laughs> <laughs> to tell the truth, it's my fault. I have all the originals of the group. They were returned to me, they very large, I put them in the storage, and I cannot access it because I have so much basura <laughs> in, in the in the storage that I haven't been able to access the original copy to make the reprints for the next book would be Odyssey. So it's really my fault. But well, when they reprinted on the Sun story that I did 20 years ago, I could not find your artwork. So I read through that story. Don't hmm. you want to read through <laughs> <laughs> What do you think we've been doing all these years? <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're going to wrap this up. Let's take, the, the run of you is, uh, I'm, I'm going to use, I'm going to, since I did all the panels this morning, I'm letting these panels run a little longer. So when we finish here, when we say goodbye, when we did as quickly as you could so we can get the next panel going, we can make this panel go longer if they all promise to leave faster, all right? <laughs> okay, the last two questions here. And okay. If you want to go to another panel someplace else, you can leave now. We've got people lined up outside waiting to get to the next one for your seats. Yes. I'm going to be volunteering on the dig at the Wolverine Carpets this summer. And with your permission, if I find someone I'd love there, if I find part of the human, I'd love to ask them to make a group. Uh, <laughs> that's a statement. The question yeah. is, I'm also watching a lot of silent movies in the Academy, and uh, it, it struck me and reminds me a lot of group. So my question to you guys is, when you're putting together a group, do you harken back to particular silent films or a silent film and eat the, the pantomime that's part of that? Any kind of a large influence on the film. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any, any silent comedies or kind of like things that were influenced on growth? Uh, all my humor is based on part of my silent movies. <laughs> and I'm a silent comedian, I'm Marcel Massot, I'm Jacques Coppi, and, uh, uh, and uh, there are all the French humorists on the earlier, and absolutely Chaplin, and uh, every, everybody who did things without words have been totally impressed. And everything I've ever written was basically stolen from Laurel and Hardy movies. <laughs> yes, last question. Thank you. Um, I'll try to make this quick. Uh, actually, this is for Stan. Um, I bumped into you two, I guess two years ago now at the Calgary Comic Con up in Canada. And I started reading Usagi Jimbo really slowly, piecemeal, trying to get uh, as many as I could. 
Um, two part question. Do you have an ending in mind? If not, great, because you should just keep writing it forever. <laughs> and if you do, do you have plans for a different story after this? When I first created Usagi, there was a definite ending, and he dies a glorious death. He would have loved it. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of uh, obsolete now. Um, right now, it's open ended. There is no ending. I thought he was going to reach a, a marry a rich lady and become a dancer of a rich I knew, yeah. And then the show. Oh, that's kind of like the town. You should become the show. <laughs> Folks, Shrek, thank you for being part of the channel.